Well, hello, and welcome to Gallifrey's Most Wanted. I'm Ross Aiken. I am joined by Dave David Steele from the Earth 2 Podcast. Say hi, David. Hello, David. Hello, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, we're going to be discussing season 15. Uh, I was kind of inspired uh, when they announced that the Blu-ray is coming out. For you guys soon, for us sometime yep. next, in about six months. Um yep. And me and David, you know, he's guested on my uh, Opal City Confidential and Stop Let's Team Up podcast. And he's been gracious enough to let me voice some of my favorite Golden Age characters on Earth 2 podcast. And he's, a, you were on, how long were you on Power 3? I'm still on it occasionally. Yeah, okay. I'm still on it occasionally. Whenever Kenny gets desperate or has a last minute idea, um, but I, I, he did he did a, a sort of daily episodes in November there leading up to the anniversary and I was on quite a few of those. Ooh. So I'm still on I think I'm on it this week as well. I'm on it quite <laughs> I'm on it maybe half the time these days, not as regularly as I used to be, but I'm still on it. So but but it may be we've talked about you coming on Gallifrey's yeah. Most Wanted doing something, and I thought this would be a great one. Because I well, like to I love talking about seasons. And hearing what people think about them, and then I do like the last. Right, we're going to rank them and compare mm -hmm. our rankings, which is always fun. Um, the last one I did, I did with Jeff and Creature of the Pit, <laughs> <laughs> with both of our number one picks. Wow! Yeah, I have to say it's it's great to be here, following in, in the footsteps of some of some really good guys. Um, so it's yeah, it's cool to be here. Thank you. And, it's, season 15 is a fun one for me to talk about because it's the first season that I have clear memories of every story. From oh, that's Glee. very cool. So this is yours. Yeah. See, mine, mine would be Ark in Space, but I was seeing it in a in an endless loop. Sure. You know, in re, in syndication. And we had these intro that we, it, when I was a kid, it had this famous actor, Howard De Silva, doing previously on Doctor Who. <laughs> yeah, so, I've heard about I don't think I've ever seen them though. I wonder if they're on YouTube. They're on, they are. They're really grainy, crappy copies. But he's most yeah. famous for being the villain in the Kentuckian with Gary Cooper, right? And playing Benjamin Franklin in the musical 1776. Interesting. So, Interesting. Yeah. So, but it's but I mine was Ark in Space, but we saw Ark in Space through Invasion of Time in a loop, right? For years, that was all we had. Right. But this is a season I really love. Um, and I've never been the biggest Graham Williams kind of fan, mm -hmm. but I do like this season a lot. So yeah, I have. It's a it's a mixed bag. This one, I think. Yeah. There's some. I mean, there's one story in this season that is in my top five Doctor Who stories of all time. It's in my top ten. Yeah. Yeah, and then there's some some other stuff which you know there's a lot to enjoy, but the quality. The quality varies enormous. I think it's sort of like like a lot of some of the sixties stuff. I think the um the scope of their imagination is maybe greater than the scope of their ability to realise it. But also there was a lot of industrial action going on at the BBC. There was a lot of difficulties. Inflation was a big thing. There were, you know, Britain was didn't have a lot of cash at this point in the seventies. You know, my dad was unemployed for a while around about this time. Um, and it's you know it's one of these seasons you're kind of. It's a miracle they got some of it to screen, really, in a, in some ways, you know. But oh yeah. The, the same, a lot as we all know, the same sort of problems happened as well with season seventeen. You know, they lost Shada completely, you know. Oh yeah, so yeah. Um, it was it was tough times. I think Graham Williams, um, he did very well given the circumstances. Yeah, I mean it, and and his home's the script editor for the whole. Yeah, he is the script editor for the whole season. Yeah, I forgot he. I forgot he did one yeah. season with Graham, and I love. Yeah. I like him as a, he's my favorite old school Doctor Who writer. Yes, I agree. I would agree. Yeah, yeah. I think he just the best. He, he, yeah, and he's a great, and he is a great script editor. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, the show was really blessed, like for between him and Terrence for yeah almost a decade. Yeah, and I, I think, think that I think Robert Holmes. Um, you can tell when Robert Holmes has worked on a script, either when he's wrote it or maybe just script edited it. When I did my last big watch through, the stuff that he worked on, it stuck out like a sore thumb. And I, and I mean that in a good way because the quality of dialogue and characterization is just so much better when he's when he's involved. Um, one of those people that just knew how, had such an instinct for what made Doctor Who work, you know? It's a shame that, that Nathan Tunnell didn't use more of them, you know, but 
well, that's another story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're going to do these in order. We're going to talk quickly about each one. There's is this a, this is a six story season, and at the end we will go backwards, our least favorite to our favorite. And to be okay. honest, folks, I don't do it until I've kind of walked through it. We're talking. I mean, I right. know which I know what my number one's going to be because if that yes. would be, you know, <laughs> it's just figuring out where the others come in the race. But yep. it's you know, I enjoy this. So we're going to start with Horror Fang Rock, which was written by uh, Terrence Dix, directed by Patty Russell. Um, and it was on from September 3rd, 1977 to ni- uh, September 24th, 1977. So I'm going to let you go. It, oh, whoa, no, wait a minute. I, no, I, I, let me back up, folks. I didn't, I meant to ask you right. this. And we'll do it right now. What's your <laughs> Doctor Who origin story? Right. Well, we always watched it. And I've told this so many times over the years, it was almost rehearsed. We watched it. We always watched it in our house. My folks had watched it before I was born. I was born during season 10. Um, I always, it was just part of the the television wallpaper growing up. The story I remember, my my earliest memory of is Deadly Assassin. I remember the repeat of Deadly Assassin a year later and knowing what was coming and being scared again. I remember Robots of Death and Wing Chang when they first went out. Um, We always watched it. And I remember the books being in the library, being in the school library, being in the book club sheets at, at school. Um, and right about the same time, the same time the season was sort of going on, there was a, a program starting on BBC One called All Creatures Great and Small, which was based on the the books by the My Vet mother's Jay- favourite, my mother's favourite show. She had a crush yeah. on Peter Davison. It was creepy. Yeah. <laughs> We used to watch that in our house as well. My mum, Colleen, could play the theme tune on the piano. <laughs> um, and All oh, Creatures Great and Small was huge. And the big part of that was was Peter Davison because mm-hmm. his character, you know, the third lead, who was the funny one, he was always getting into trouble and being tricky. And um, and this is this is the other big aspect of it. I um, I had dark curly hair when I was a boy. Ross, <laughs> look, Ross is looking aghast at me now. He's wondering where I'm going. And I hated it because I couldn't do anything. It was horrible. I, I would kill for it now. I killed to still have it. But you couldn't, I couldn't do anything. It was just this mop in my head. And Peter Davison and people like him and David McCallum, you know, and Simon McCorkendale, who you would see on television, they just had blonde straight hair, which looked amazing by comparison. And I, I loved Peter's character, Tristan. And Peter was on television a lot. He was in Doctor Who. He was on a program that we watched called Once Upon a Time. Um, he had a couple of sitcoms and stuff. He was everywhere. So Tom Baker's last season is going on. And I think we must have watched Buck Rogers maybe for a couple of weeks because we didn't see the first few episodes. But I've I've got really clear memories from essentially full circle onwards. We watched all of Tom's last series. Just keep me just, you know, regularly because we we're enjoying the stories. Full circle is the last story to give me bad dreams. I had nightmares about the Marshmen for years. And um, Andrew Smith knows this. <laughs> <laughs> no Andrew in real life, so he he's he's fully aware of this and is quite proud of the fact that <laughs> I had bad dreams about the Marshmen chasing me down white corridors. Um, but we followed through full circle and State of Decay and Warriors Gate and, and Keeper of Track and and Legopolis. And I remembered the Master shrinking people because of my memories. My my memories of being terrified by the deadly assassin because I remembered the the G.I. Joe action man figure. Mm-hmm. Um and somehow I had completely missed all of the media brouhaha about Tom Baker leaving. Now I was a bright kid. Um I read I mean I remember reading about Superman 2 coming out in the newspaper and stuff and all sorts of other stuff. I remember um Ronnie Reagan winning the election. I remember Margaret Thatcher winning and being politically aware of what all that meant. But I completely missed everything about Tom leaving. So we're watching Legopolis and it gets to the end of episode four. And I can remember this 43 years ago and I can remember it so clearly. Um, the doctor was hanging off the big the big satellite dish, as I always call it. And he started remembering all the 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 monsters and the enemies that he'd fought. And then he fell to the ground and Adric and Tegan and Nissa ran over. And I remembered all this, this the way in my head it was some of the faces were in black and white. And I didn't know who they all were. But I recognised some of them because I remember seeing Romana and seeing K9. And I remember saying to my mum, because I, I I grasped this was his life flashing before his eyes. And I grasped, you know, I remember so well saying to my mum, 
mum, it's one of those ones, because I knew the doctor could change. And the reason I knew the doctor could change was that I had seen, I had seen books, and as I said already, but there used to be a, a sort of kids cinema quiz programme on British TV called Screen Test, which one day had a clip from the second Dalek movie. And I remember saying to my dad, right, if that's the Daleks, where's the doctor? And my dad pointing at Cushing and saying, that's him with a scarf. And I went, of course, he's got a scarf, Doctor Who always has a scarf. So I knew that there could be different doctors and they would have scarves. Mm -hmm. So Tom has fallen and Tom changes into Tristan Farnan from All Creatures Great. <laughs> it's the greatest thing I had ever mm -hmm. seen in my life. Oh, I like that. I like that. My mom had a, a, I gave her a pin of Peter Davison as the doctor. And she referred, <laughs> she referred to her, even into her 80s. Ooh, my Trissy. <laughs> like, <laughs> but that was it. That was it for me. I, um, I kind of became hooked. I started reading the books around at the same time as I was reading maybe the Narnia books or the Biggles books or the, or, um, the Hardy Boys and the Alfred Hitchcock, Three Investigators, when I was reading all that sort of stuff. Um, later in the year, later in 1981, obviously there was the five faces of Doctor Who repeat season in the UK, which so went and saw the first Doctor and the second Doctor, had the mind-blowing um, realisation that the guy who played Wurzel Gummidge used to be Doctor Who. And that, that was like, that was kind of in some ways the reverse of Tristan taking over. It was like, yeah. Wurzel Gummidge used to be, there he was, and he was so cool and elegant and smart, and it was, um, was mind-blowing. So 1981 was when it all changed for me. And it's kind of um, it's kind of waxed and waned over the years. There's been periods when I've been really, really into it, and periods when I, I've drifted away. I drifted away during the hiatus in '85. That's when I properly got into comics. Um, and over the, the years since, it's kind of waxed and waned. Um, like everyone else, I was really happy when it came back in 2005. Um, my satisfaction since Russell left the first time has been kind of up and down. Um, I've been in and out of big finish at various points. Read lots of the original novels at times, um, but I kind of I never quite let go. It's always there. Yeah, it was my you know I for me it was kind of comics were my first love. Comics and Star Trek, you know, mm -hmm. watching because I my brother's like you want some sitting on my lap, but don't remember it because I was but it was I was born before Star Trek started, right? So I was a baby. And he watched it. And then in my, where I grew up, it was on f at four o'clock on channel 20 for 20 years in a, right. in a loop. And then when I was 13, whatever, 1970, I guess, yeah, when I was like 13 or whatever, I think my brother said, Hey, there's this famous show. He had given me the, 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 the pinnacle novelist are we, you know, when America, we yeah. had the pinnacle ones. Yeah, those and he told me about it and he knew a little bit about it he had seen like one or two pertwees in the 70s on dc tv sure. somewhere and but i started watching the time life had him and we could we caught it out of baltimore and it was tom baker and i started first one i saw was ark in space right and i saw elizabeth sladen and my 13 year old heart melted <laughs> um and i for that you yes, know lovely. i met her so a few times she great. i would love to have got to meet her get a picture because she is there are only two times Victoria, my friend, uh, my best friend who I'd started this podcast with, ever checked on me to see if I was okay when a, someone famous died was LeVon Helm, the lead singer and drummer of the band, because he's my favorite. He's the band is my favorite band and he's my favorite member of the band. And when Elizabeth Sladen died, he, she called, you go, okay? And I went, no, not really. Not okay. Yeah, not okay. <laughs> Mourning a little bit, you know? Yeah. But. No, it was yeah, it was a big deal when Lizzie left. I met her um '96, and I think again in I want to say I want to say 2000. I think that was the twice I met her. Yeah, yeah. I bet she was just lovely. I, yeah, but this is a um and oh and also until Matt Smith came along because Matt Smith is kind of my doctor now. Peter was my doctor because right. it was my first new one. Yeah, sure. You know, yeah. because yeah, so I yeah, really. Pete was really my doctor when I was a little boy. I mean, um, it, and nowadays I sort of say out of them all, I, I, I say that Bill's my favourite and I think I think that Tom and David are the best and Matt's my favourite of the modern ones. But I still have a soft spot for Davison. Like, um, the first time I met him at a convention was in 1997 and it was very, for me, it was very intense. It was almost overwhelming. I, I had to sort of go and 
you know, I've made a, to make a real effort to keep it together and had to go and mm. sit at the back of the video room and kind of just kind of, can, you know, for a, for about half an hour. And honestly, I was bouncing for weeks. I was on a, I was an absolute cloud nine because I, I hadn't really, that was the year I started going to conventions regularly. I hadn't really done it before because I didn't know any other Doctor Who fans when I was growing up. So the, I never thought I'd meet him. And when I did, and he was he was really cool, really calm, very professional. And I met you know met him a few times since then. Got a photograph with him in two thousand, I think. Um, and he's and he's great. Yeah, a lot of time for him. He's 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 very good. I remember an interview that he gave in a magazine around about two thousand, sort of saying when he's at conventions, he says you're very aware that you're giving people one of the biggest thrills of their lives, and he never knows. He never knew how to live up to it. And I sort of thought, yeah, I was one of those folk. You probably knew completely that I was freaking out, you know. <laughs> and you know, I, I, I've I've met a few. I mean, I met Colin, I've got I've had I've got pictures with Colin and um, Capaldi, me and Vic together. We got we met William Russell, which was like, wow, cool. don't touch him. He's frail. Yeah, he was very old. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, yeah, but it was neat. It was like, wow, you are, mm. um, you know. And I got a picture with David Tennant this year, but. I, my first autograph, my bro, dad took me to a, 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 a Star Trek convention, one of the first ones in 1972 at Landmark at the hotel in Arlington, Virginia. And I got Scotty's right. autograph and it's, I've still got it. It's not a picture. It's a picture of the scar, you know, the Enterprise flying over a cloud and signed Jimmy Doohan. Wow. And Brilliant. I still have it. And then about 10 years later, I was working at a comic convention because I worked for Steve Jeppe, one, ran one of his stores, and I had to do a con or something. And I got sure. tore up drunk with him at a bar. <laughs> <laughs> I um shared, shared a taxi with Colin Baker once. Oh, very cool. He, he was in a he was um doing a play and he was in Glasgow, so a few of us took him out for dinner and he was staying in a flat on the south side, not too far away from me. So we shared a taxi and that was pretty cool. And then he, he came into the the um the record shop I was working in the next day and abused my staff discount so he could get get some money off. That was quite fun. Oh, um, that's cool. Yeah, I'd I like to few, really met... get to talk to him because when I go to conventions, I just yeah. say you know it's quick and you don't really get to talk. And especially Colin's in America, probably, Colin's great because I was sort of you know that was another time I'd, I'd learned how to keep it together. By that point, when was it? Two thousand eight, I think. And I just said you know, when he when we were sort of parting, sort of he was going into his building, I was going that way, and I said, listen, you know. Cheers for the last 25 years, as it had been at that point, you know, since he'd started. And he said, it's been a pleasure. And I was just like, class act. What yeah. a class. He's so good at cons. He, he's one of the best ambassadors the show will ever have. I love him. He's brilliant. I'm really excited about the, the big finish set that's coming out in a few weeks for his, his 40th anniversary. That looks uh really good. Yeah, I'm gonna get that in the special edition one. Actually, may I have one mailed because I was I went to a Regen Con and uh, Jason Hay Gallery was there, and Vic had to work the table. She said she'd volunteer and help him out at the con. Right. And I got to meet um, Flip. Oh, uh, Lisa yeah, Greenwood, Lisa. and I got a picture with Lisa. her, and I she love that really character. And she was just the sweetest, sweetest human being you'd ever want to meet. She is just yeah, a. Lisa. a Lisa is amazing. Like her character, her portrayal of that character is is my favorite thing that Big Finish have ever done. Like she reminds me so much of so many of the the girls I worked with in HMV. You know, girls who maybe by their own admission were the book didn't have the book smarts, didn't go to uni or all that, but had so much emotional intelligence and practical intelligence, and was so you know clever. She's she's phenomenal. I'm so that's why I'm really excited about. I mean, yeah, me too. It's like I uh, love Constance. I love Mel. I love everything they've done with Colin and Big Finish. There are a couple turkeys that early on, but but I think Colin has created a. You know what I mean? They've created a little bubble for him, and it's amazing. They really have. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, season so fifteen. Season fifteen. So horror, Fang Rock, Karen yeah. Sticks, and Patty Russell. You get. Let, I'll let you go first on this one. Well, this is one that I remember quite clearly from when it went out. I remember um, the doctor hanging off the, the side of the, of the lighthouse because when you're, what, four and a half, you're fascinated by lighthouses. Um, I remember the, the point of view shots of the, the Rutan. Um, and it's it works really well. It's one of these sort of what they, I think Doctor Who fans used to call it base under siege type stories. Yeah. It's very similar, actually, in a lot of ways to um, Robots of Death, which is only a couple of stories before it in the chronology where you've got you know, a small number of people in a confined space and, you know, they're all being picked off one by one. Um, I love it for the... 
the, sim the simple sort of setup, you know, they're all trapped in the lighthouse. It's in the and it's you know in Earth's past, so you know they've got that Edwardian thing going on. But in a way that I think the series is lost nowadays. Um, all the supporting characters get plenty to do, and they're all really well drawn and really well acted, and you really care for all of them. Um, when you know the older chap, you know when he goes, you know when he goes to scrabble for the diamonds at the end. Every single time I watch this story, I'm like, no. I wish he hadn't done it. And then the lad playing Vince is, is superb. The guy who'd been in, I think he was in um, Web of Fear as the, as the captain is back in this one and he's really good. Colin Douglas, who was an enemy of the world as well. Yeah. He's phenomenal. As the old, the old keeper. Oh, he's Ruben. Ruben. He's so good. Um, yeah. And it's, um, Tom and Louise are just phenomenal. People sort of say that Tom's in a bad mood in it because he went, because they had to go to Birmingham to film it. Um, and I don't know how much of that is, is sort of really true. But I think Tom, Tom I th I'm of the opinion Louise Jameson is the is the best actor to ever appear in Doctor Who. Full stop, and she's amazing in this. That's a the bold. That's a bold statement, but I no, I, I, I think I, she I, is the best in a lot of the early ones. I think she is. She's the one that I absolutely stand by it, and I'll, yeah. I'll come back to that in a couple of stories time. Um, I this this is the one that's in my my top five of all time. It's it's. It's possibly even it's possibly even top three for me. It's because it's such a a strong, straightforward story idea. It does what Doctor Who does best in that you've got the juxtaposition of Green Alien versus Edwardian Lighthouse, and you've got two of the best actors ever to appear on the programme as the leads carrying it, sailing all the way through it. And it's I I have no fault with it at all, apart from Maybe you know the um the spaceship could have been done a little better, but you know that's picky. I I love it unconditionally. I think um yeah, I do too. Uh, it came in. It was number eleven when the last time I did the randomizer before the specials this year. Um, but every time I saw it and I picked it, and it's to me, is it my favorite Doctor Who? But is it no? But is it a near perfect Doctor Who? It is. For a lot, yeah. every, for all the things you're saying, you have a cast of like eight. They're all unique. They all they all have a part a part to play in the story. They all are three dimensional characters. The dialogue, I think it's the best script Terrence Six ever wrote. Yeah, it's great, and the fact that you had to do it sort of last minute, sort of thing. I believe. Um, I think yeah. was, was this one that you had to write because they couldn't do the Dracula. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. That's when they Vampire. lost Dracula. Yeah, and they yeah, had because, to do. Um, yeah, which obviously they, they they reuse the state of decay, but you know, and it's and it shows you know Terrence Dicks writing that Robert Holmes is scripted, or you know they could do it in the sleep at this point, but it no, but it never seems like it's kind of diluted or not as good as it could be. You know, it's it's excellent. Yeah, there's no fat on this, and I and because Doctor is serialized, and in the nature of serialized, you may have to repeat action, which yeah. is something I joke about a lot. Like you know, yeah. and Genesis Daleks is a great story, but man, they keep passing each other in the same damn tunnel for three episodes. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. and stuff like that. But there's nothing in that, and I let you love yeah. every character, and yeah. sometimes you know it's acted in the past. I mean, I'm not saying that Louise Jameson is like so good in this, and so it, him, her, and Tom, you know, mm -hmm. are so good, and they're not playing down to the audience or to the material ever. You know no, what I mean? Tom gets a little yeah. muggy later in life, but they're Tom, playing it as if they were doing Shakespeare. Tom at this point is still taking it seriously. I mean, this is the beginning of his fourth series. Um, so he, he's still taking it seriously. And this, you, this is the season, and I'll give you the examples. This is the season when he starts to flex his muscles a little bit. And, um, I don't think that's always a good thing, but at this no. point, <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> at this point, he's always he's still completely, you know, firing on all cylinders. He's in the huff because they're not filming in London, but he's still, yeah, he's still committed. But, and this script really plays to his strengths, and the strengths of his doctor, Terence, really kind of knows it. That you know, yeah. he is very alien. The dialogue. Yeah. I mean, it. I mean, he's given. Tom, depending, Tom, I think Tom is different based on the love, level of the material he's given. Sometimes he can fix it. Sometimes he makes it worse. Yeah. 
yeah. you know, depending on what he, what mood he's in and what's going on. Yeah. Uh, but well, he, in this one, it's, it's just so good. And he has such great lines. Yeah. The, for me, the sort of defining characteristic for the fourth doctor, he, he, he has this detached irreverence sort of thing. Um, I think part of the detachment is a reaction to how his previous body was was down to earth for so long and got quite fond of the humans and his responses to no, I'm I'm away from that, you know. And it takes him a while to break the to break the threads, but he he has sort of he has that irreverent quality where he doesn't you. Know, like Revenge of the Cybermen when he's quoting Shakespeare at the Dead Cyberman, for example, you know, he's, he's, his alien quality is that he knows that all these little human concerns are below him, that he's probably going to be okay. It doesn't really affect him. Um, and he kind of loses the detached thing when Romana comes along. Um, I think that's just because he's enjoying flirting with someone from his own race who's a bit younger than him. But it kind of comes back when she goes. Um, and this one, you can see the detachment when uh, there's so many scenes where he sort of sat, you know, at the front of the screen, and other conversations are going on behind him. And he is his only, only con his only, on his only contribution to them is to make some sort of sweeping statement that they haven't re or point that they haven't realised yet. Um, and it's almost like he's looking down at them all, but he knows it's his responsibility to try and help them as much as he can. But because he's he has this Olympian almost detachment from it, he gives the sense that he doesn't. It's almost like that he doesn't care in a way. Yeah, yeah. And I know what you're talking about because there's scenes in the in the like the mess hall or whatever the canteen. Yeah. you know what I mean. Where that that like the other characters are telling their kind of story. Yeah. Um, and it's he's just. You know he's taking it in. Yeah. But yeah, but how how good they are and how he's uh, yeah. Tom is he's engaged and he's hearing what they're saying. But it and it's not to, what I like about the writing is nothing they say is unimportant. Mm. Whether it's just to create build the world building uh, to yeah. use a, no, not to use that's the best term for it, world building. Yeah. He, yeah. Terrence builds the world of this lighthouse. Yeah. They're all three dimensional characters. You believe their relationships. You understand their foibles. You know, yeah. like you said, you like eh, almost all of them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not, when the rich dude gets killed, I'm like, God, fuck that. Why would, could have got him earlier. <laughs> yeah. but, but, you know, when, when Vince dies, you feel it because he's been in it since the start. And the, you know, the, the young, he's the young one. The older yeah. One, the, he's all that. Older. And, you know, Vince has a lot of good scenes with the Doctor and Leela. So you're, he, he's the one you would want to make it to the end. Yeah. Um, all the stuff with him being bribed to send the message and all that is really, really interesting. It just adds a bit. As I said, it gives the, the supporting cast some really good stuff to do. And that just never happens in the, the show anymore. You know, the, the plots are either so f f condensed that they have to, you know, get through everything in 45 minutes. So there's no room for supporting characters or guest cast to do much, or the plots are about the doctor and the companion. So you know you don't get even you hardly even get a supporting cast. Yeah, uh, that's my hope. That's my hope. At some point we get we get some two part stories again because you think back to stuff like you know the almost people or the impossible planet or rise of the Cybermen or whatever. When there's room for the guest yeah. actors to get something, pro and that doesn't happen very often in the normal ones. So, but but this is just. This story just really shows what Doctor Who used to be used to be like, and I think why people of my generation really liked it as much as they did. Yeah, I, I, as someone, I very because I've done theater, and to me, and the way I view stories is, I can separate things. Like I love old Who and I love new Who, but they yeah. are two totally different monsters. So I, yeah. I can read a Silver Age comic book and then read something written today. Because I have to take it for when it was created, you know, exactly. and, and art yeah. evolves and the, yeah. and the way storytelling evolves. But the thing I that what I I agree, I prefer a two parter. I hate it when they get rid of them. Yeah. Um, I think so, Russell gets around it by having such a bigger supporting cast, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. but that's still the regulars. So you got mom, dad, yeah. cousin, grandpa, yeah. that, that, but that's yeah. a different uh, thing. But yeah. 
but the some of the the, the reason I and during the pandemic when I was doing a rewatch and I was really I started the Blu-rays were coming out, I started focusing again more on old. I found that that's a thing I missed. And the yeah. thing that I in the ones that I love, my favorite old who ones are the ones that have great guest casts. Yeah. And great characters. I think it's one of the reasons my sort of creeping dissatisfaction with the new stuff over the years has just been it's just not as good a meal as it used to be in, in that regard. You don't there's not as much to kind of savor and, and relish, you know, actors, you know, giving the, the the chance to do good stuff. You know, it's it's almost like here's the setup, you know, because they all know that nowadays the 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 end of the the cold open is what probably would have been the the first cliffhanger in the olden days. So you, that's in the olden days. That's when you would have had, you know, the chunk of the the guest cast getting the most to do. But now, well now more often than not, they maybe just get killed off by the monster that's revealed in the cold open. Yeah. Um it's, it's. I think it's. I would love one of the. I would. I would love Russell to, or maybe one of the other, if he ever gets replaced. You know, someone to kind of try and take it back a little bit and just kind of slow it down because I think people. You know, I don't think people really need it to be hurled at them in a way. You know, no, they, 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 all the the four episodes that we've, the most recent episodes we've just had, you know, they were all essentially about the Doctor and or Donna and or you know Ruby, and and there was just no room for anything else. And whilst they were enjoyable in their own their own way, and it was great having Davy and Catherine back, but it just felt in a way it was like it feels too much now to me, like you know, fast fast food no right. that's a good analogy i agree i like i'm um i like a little flash but that when i watch modern who in a lot of ways i know i'm getting i'm going to and i think there are some really powerful ones in this format i mean I, there are ones i absolutely love that are real there are some single episodes that are great but for the most part it's really like a wow a bang it's it's very yeah. flashy and I don't yeah. mean that in a bad way, but it's it's a lot more about spectacle at the same time. It's it is yeah. more about the companions, and that's Davies. That's he wanted it to be about the companion yeah. and the doctor, yeah. and about and that their relationship and all the other stuff is instead of being yeah. story driven. It's there's a story, but there's we're really yeah. reevaluating the main characters. But I know what yeah. you mean, and that one like this, it just it shows you why that that why not? That's I true. think, yeah, uh, I think like. The first Doctor Who I ever watched in serial form that was a serialized story right. live was Jody's last season. Because That's I hard. watched all these in reruns, so I could watch right. them in order. Sure. I bought the DVD and I watched them straight sure. through. So, Or when sure. I was growing up in DC, they were in omnibus form. That's yeah. what we got. Yeah. I mean, so, when, I did, when I did my big rewatch, I sort of limited myself to... Um, to no more than because I'd, I'd be watching, I'd be coming home from work and I'd watch two episodes while I was preparing and eating my dinner. And the only time I cheated was when I went, I did two the last two episodes of The Toy Maker and I watched the first episode of The Gunfighters because I wanted to know what happened next with the, with the tooth and not the doctor breaking his tooth. I was like, no, I'm going to cheat. And watching it, even if not just an episode at a time, two episodes at a time. Is amazing. The, ne the next time you get a, a a classic season box set, I'm going to it's challenge gonna... you to to watch an episode. Don't if you're watching a story, don't watch them all in one go. Watch an episode a day. Treat yourself. Space it out over a month. Watch it, and I guarantee you. You know what? The it. next one we're getting here, season twenty. Right. I because I, th I I think I think Brandon said something about that recently. That um, we get them about we get about the time you yeah. get the next one. We're getting your last one. Yeah. Yeah, because Brandon's one person I know that orders the British editions. So I bought some and I had to sell them for money. I wish yeah. I had them. I have a I have a region region free player. Yeah, so I could get and the Steve, steel book of the animated. My friend Steve has said the same. He um he kind of gets a little frustrated because you know we'll be over here. We'll, Kenny and I will be doing an episode when we're talking about the the bonus features of the new Blu-ray set, and Steve's like, "Damn it, I've no idea when we're going to see this." You know. Yeah, um, and that's the best set. That is, I love those sets because those interviews, yeah. Matthew Sweet interviews, oh, it's amazing, amazing. You know, yeah, they're always the first thing I watch, and I think I'm, I'm presuming it. I think it's Louise that he's going to be talking to this time. Yes, it is, be... but, but it's going to be lovely, lovely. Well, let's move on because I have a lot of opinions about the second story. Right then, the Invisible Enemy, written by Bob Barker, Bob Baker, and Dave Martin, directed by Derek Goodwin, 
um, The Invisible Enemy from October 1st, 1977 to October 22nd, 1977. I would be, this would be my 13th birthday, would be eight to six days after this aired. Finished wow. Aired. Uh, cool. And I absolutely, this is one that one well, yeah, thing. Yeah, of course. Because I, I know when your birthday is, of course, because it's, yeah, it's the same day as my dad's, of course. Yeah. yeah. And Matt Smith. And Ian <laughs> Uh, um, I really this one is one that has one thing that takes me completely out of it and I'm irrational about it and I don't care it's just right. that fucking prawn right now, <laughs> here's the thing here's the thing right now as I've said I was four and a half when this okay. did that terrify you Ross to this day you can't I have see never <laughs> I have never eaten a prawn in my life <laughs> I cannot face them. If I see them on a salad or on a fucking sushi bar type situation or on a plate, I'm like, get that away. Because this <laughs> fucker got me first. I, you know, my folks, my folks weren't I'm not gonna I'm not gonna put them down when I see this. They, were, they, they weren't eating prawns in Paisley in 1977, you know? Mm -hmm. I had no context. So I I remember watching a story and being aware of K9 and the people with the stuff stuck to their faces and all the you know the all the running about, but the episode that finished and I can, this was one of the last stories to come out in VHS, um, and I hadn't seen it since it went out. I remember watching it, and even now there's a reason to, it's one of the last that come yeah. out of VHS. And even now, if I it's, it's the end of, is it the end of, it's the end of part three, I think, isn't it? When you know, you have to remember, four years old, right? And I remembered being scared by the clown and under the sand and deadly assassin, by the horse and the gas mask, by Magnus Greel, Leela pulling off Magnus Greel's mask, um, being unsettled by the green thing in Horror Fang Rock. But in the part three, da -da -da, the, I mean the music, and they put they put the slide. I know now what they were doing. They're putting the slide in the thingy so they can magnify it. And this, the scariest, unearthliest, most non-human looking non-reassuring, non-cuddly type creature I'd ever seen. And I, I can remember being like, you know, so terrified and hiding behind the cushion or jumping behind it properly. I just knocked over my DVDs. Properly behind the couch, terrified by this thing. And even to this day, it unsettles me. Oh my God. Um, there, but, and it's, I think it is this, this is one too, where I think where you were talking earlier about whether their ambition Yes. The, uh, I actually will only watch this with the new special effects because it's the only way I can get through it. <laughs> because right. I feel bad for them. <laughs> I mean, I did theater on a shoestring and I've made some sh crap sets and perform, right. you know, and it's, you feel like people go, aren't you, wouldn't you want it to be better? It's like, that's good for what I had. So yeah. I'm proud of what I accomplished with shit. Yes. But this one, it's like, it's almost as like a like a parody. It's so well, bad at times because because it was so late coming out in VHS, and because you know I have this lingering on um, on ease. It's not one that I've watched very often. I've probably only watched it twice since it since it came out on home media twice, three times tops. So it's one that I'm not overly familiar with. But I remember um. It's, I think I, I think I'm right in saying that um, Derek Goodwin was a was a BBC special effects guy, and they gave him a turn at it because he had you know understood what they were trying to do with some of the special effects, or or might I might be confusing that with a guy that did, directed Underworld. I think that's what I'm doing there. So for scratch that, um, it's the scenes of like you know the Tom and Louise running and then they they back they're obviously running about in a small set and they back you know projected them into a swirling water vortex and all that yeah. you watch it as an adult yeah and it looks crap but i think when you watch it at 4 years old it's the scariest thing you'll ever see in your life it's very unsettling the way that people are possessed and taken over it's a story Big Finish did a sequel sort of prequel story with it um with Sylvester's doctor a few years ago and it yeah, was terrible but you I hated it because it yeah. was just unnecessarily complicated. And I didn't really understand what it was actually trying to say. I think they tried to say that the Seventh Doctor was responsible for creating the nucleus or something. I can't. Well, I don't think I've. I maybe if like I that. that I listen to a lot of Big Finish and some of them are great and some don't stick. Yeah, 
This, yeah. I mean, this was a real one because I'm a big fan of that, that writer normally, but it really didn't land with me. But then, I mean, it's it's one of the I, I can see what you mean, like the special effects and the sets are starting to look a bit. You know, they're too brightly lit. There's, you know, That's my big the, problem with a lot of later old Who yeah. is like turn the damn lamps down. Yeah, it's it doesn't have a lot of atmosphere. Um, it's a bit yeah. Some some of the execution is pretty shoddy, but I, I have the lingering nostalgia for it because um you know. I love the dog. <laughs> no, well, no, no, no. I don't. I Enzo, didn't get introduces the dog. Um, I, did, and, I didn't because, get the dog until my goddaughter met John Leeson and he was very right. sweet to her and he did the voice and she loved the dog. She was a little girl. And I went, okay, I get it now. Through her eyes, I get it. And he's so nice. You're kind of like, okay. Yeah. But uh, but I can, I can agree with you that some of the execution is a bit shoddy. I mean, if someone like, let's have a think. If someone like Christopher Barry... Or Dougie Camfield had done it, maybe you know. And they, might, it, but, there's, there's like, good, there's. I like the plot. I like the concept. Yeah. I like the Fantastic Voyage kind of thing. Yeah. It's yeah. just a, a four foot tall actor in a translucent prawn costume. To me, it's the opposite because I was when I saw it, I was probably like seventeen, eighteen, sure, maybe even twenty. I just watched yeah. it and went. I'm not even high enough to enjoy this. <laughs> <laughs> so it's yeah. just, and it's one of those misses. And it's why I think having watched Tom in a loop and then we got these and I was like, what's going on? And then we got, well, once we got to Peter and then even Colin, I didn't, but seeing new doctors, I kind of was more forgiving. Sure. I had Tom Baker burn out by this point. But this is yeah. one that it's not him. He's he's doing him and Louise are doing all they can. Yes. And I like the guy that plays the professor. There are and and Leeson's well, playing. He's yeah, and yeah. John Leeson is really acting as that dog. I've never counted <laughs> dis, discounted that. That John Lee, there is a performance in the dog. Yeah, absolutely. That he is a real character. Yeah, very so, much so. So um, so we don't beat up on it too much more. Let's move on to the next one, which is Image and Fendal. And I'm gonna take a turn on this one is. My last watch through through this, I fell in love with this one. It's uh, Im Image of the Fendal, writer mm -hmm. Christopher Boucher. That's always yep. a good thing. Uh, director yep. George Spenton Foster. Yep. Never heard of him again. Uh, pre it premiered on October 29th, the day after my 13th birthday. The, the, day, after, the day after my dad's 37th birthday. <laughs> um, I love... British kind of science fiction horror movies. Sure. I don't know, you know, John Wyndham movies, sure. Day of the Triffid, my yeah. what um I have a, I have five favorite films of all time. No, number one of them is Quatermass in the Pit. Yes, fantastic. You know what I mean? Yeah. That kind that yeah. only yeah. your country does. Yeah. It's set it's set in a village. It's a mix yeah. of supernatural and super science. Yep. Yeah. Let magic is science, but for a different level. They're yeah. godlike creatures. All the characters are fuck great. Granny and her nephew, I love them. Yes, Daphne Herb is a brilliant actor. She's amazing. She's I think there's thing. nothing wrong with this. People beat on it, and I said this is where Doctor Who does horror right. Yeah, it's not. I it's like a, it a lot. I, I don't think it's perfect. It's. I think it's an episode too long, really. Yeah, you can say that for a lot of Doctor Who. Yeah. <laughs> we, we, we sort of said how um, horrifying rock is quite lean. It doesn't feel, you know, overstuffed or, or under, you know, cooked or in. But I think this one does a little bit. There's a but, bit somewhere between the episodes two yeah, and the end of think, three where yeah, gets, there's off, some stuff happening again. Yeah, they go off on the ship um, and, you know, the Doctor gets locked up and you know, and for a while and then gets out and no one knows who it is. No one's ever been able to work out who it is that unlocks the door of the room that the doctor's trapped in. Um, what I like about it is that um, there's an actor in it called De Dennis Lill, who is a brilliant British actor. Um, I saw him on stage once in an Agatha Christie play opposite Kate O'Mara, which was really exciting. Um, and... Wanda Ventham, obviously, who had been in the Faceless Ones and been time in the Rani Engel, you know, um, the Shakespeare boys, not Shakespeare, the Sherlock boys, um, mum, Doctor Strange's mum, <laughs> can't remember his name. Oh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, oh, God, God, where is she? I'm looking at it. 
Engelbert Humperdinck, Benedict Cumberbatch. Yeah, his mom. Benedict she, mom. Um, yeah. And the guy from Day of the Daleks in it as well, and who has the darkest scene, the darkest death scene in all of Doctor Who when the Doctor hands him the pistol and makes his exit, and then you hear the gun go off. And yeah, you, I, when I rewatched it, I was like, what the... F I don't remember. I didn't... I, I, I don't know. I forgot about that. And it is... This is a really... And I think that's why I like it. It's because it... it you, that's the kind of crap that scares me. They had to yeah. get me to go see the uh, the Omen for the first time in college. I was right. twenty years, nineteen years old. They yeah. had to get me drunk because that stuff scares me. That little kid scares yeah. the fuck out of me. <laughs> and the skull <laughs> and all that weird. kind of magic is like why I like Quatermass in the Pit. It, they're not yeah. the devil. It's this alien, yeah, and, that, you know. And obviously, there's a fair bit of Quatermass in the Pit in this with the skull and all that sort of oh, stuff. Oh yeah. I mean, the influences are are right there. Um, it's it's one of these ones where you know there's a slight sense the doctor's kind of losing control over it, and it's I'm a little dissatisfied the way that he just kind of blows up the machine, and and um and that's what deals with it. Um, but this 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 is the one where I think that Tom starts to kind of flex it because there's a bit when he he says to Adam, you know. You've got five minutes, or you've got four minutes, and he holds up the wrong the wrong number of fingers. Um, and there's a bit when he, I think he, there's, a, I think it's this one when he he turns to the camera, he looks at the camera and says, "Time's running out," and you're like, "This is Tom starting to play silly buggers." This yeah, is yeah, Tom yeah. realizing, knowing that he's a big hit, knowing that people are watching it for him, um, and he knows, "Hey, wait a minute, they can, you know, let's see what I can do here. Let's see how far I can push this." Yeah, yeah, and, and, that, I, and we see a bit more of that over the next few stories. Um, but at this point, he's still winny and just enough that you get the sense the doctor's taking it seriously. Um, but it's it's I mean, and with the, the boy playing Adam Colby is terrific. They're all good. It's just so he's, good. It, again, it's what I was saying about the guest, a really good guest cast having it is. to do with things. Yeah, you forgive the paddedness in the middle. Because you really like them all, and they're all kind of—they're very three-dimensional. I like—it's one that has become in later years, in the last few times. It's like, you know, every time I go through a rewatch, and I'm in a perpetual one right now. I'm at—I'm about to start Sylvester, and I paused. Um, but this is there's always a new love. There's always one I find a new love for, and um, during pandemic, there was this resurgence of love for Bill Hartnell. Sure. You know what I mean? The 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 Twitch thing, and then yeah. I think I think a yeah, lot of us right. older fans reevaluated him more. Yeah. Well, he's uh, well. He, I reevaluate. I I kind of always always liked him, but it was when I it was when I did my big my my only big complete rewatch was when I reevaluated it to the extent that he's now my favorite Doctor hands down because everyone else has just done something that riffs on what he established. He yeah. maps it all out, you know, and he's and he's the governor. Um. True, there's points when he's you can tell he's a bit flaky or he doesn't get the lines right, but that doesn't matter. That's he's still the doctor, he never yeah. drops character, you know, he's, he's always he's the doctor. Um, yeah. but yeah, the, the, I remember everyone watching it on Twitch, that was great fun. I remember the buzz it was that. nice to see that people oh, young enough young, to be my grandchild, someone who could be young enough to call me, pa, you know, grandpa, uh, <laughs> were enjoying yeah. it and, and taking yeah. it seriously, like not dissing it because. You know, every generation looks back at the last generation and thinks they're already shit. Yeah. It's like, yeah. you know, yeah. and they think, well, you're not, you don't really see it. It's like, yeah, that's what I thought about the guy before me. You'll feel different. Yeah, yeah I remember okay. like, no one, no one gave a shit about the Beatles during the 1980s. You know what I mean? McCartney was a joke because Lennon had died and all this. But then, you know, the, the Britpop stuff happened over here in the mid, early mid 90s and that kind of got a lot of people the next generation come along and they discovered the Beatles because it was there's a lot of bands doing stuff very similar to them. Um yeah. and they've never kind of gone away again after that. Um no I mean Fendal it's a it's it's one that I really like. Um the, I remember the novelization reading that one as a child and being you know quite sort of enthralled by it. It's it's one that my memories my memories of this one on TV are quite vague. I don't have, I don't have specific memories as such for this one compared to the rest of the ones in the series. But it's one that I like a lot. I remember my sister actually got me the VHS on my 20th birthday. There you go. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's move on to the next one, which is The Sun Makers um, yeah. by Robert Holmes, 
directed by Pennant Roberts, uh, aired from November 26, 1977 to December 17, 1977. Yep. Um, I'll let you go first on this one. This is one, my opinion on this one literally changes every time I watch it. I remember the first time it, it came out on VHS and I watched it all the way through and thought, oh, I don't like this at all. It looks terrible. It's so beige. It's There's an awful lot of silly mugging from Tom at various points. Um, when I watched it as part of my complete big watch through, I loved it. I thought it was hilarious. I thought it was a brilliant, pointed, clever satire. And then when I watched it, I did a, a sort of Leela watch a few years after that, and I didn't like it again. <laughs> um, okay. It's, I think, it's a weird one because you've got all the stuff like, you know, all the stuff about taxation and Corridor P45, which may not mean anything over there. But, you know, all that was really, really funny. Um, but, and you know, Michael Keating from Blake 7 is in it, which is one of these things that gives it a bit more weight when you're watching it in retrospect. Um how did the dog get down that ladder? That's yeah, what I, I want. <laughs> how you get? How you know? He's, you know. I know you're a good dog, but how are you that? How are you that clever? Um, it's one that I kind of the aesthetics get in the way for it, the way for me because it's so grey and it's so dull to look at. So all the orange and browns and beige, it's it's bleh. and it's it's one that another one that I remember pretty clearly from 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 it going out. Um, I remember the man being thrown off the building at the end, you know, don't you shout and don't you dare and all that, because we used to, that was a, a something that we used to say to kind of bait each other as kids, because uh, I remember that very, very well. Um, but it's kind of, it's one that I, I don't revisit it very often because it's, to me, it's just cheap 70s BBC and not in a good way. The contrast between this one and Fendal is it's huge, you know. Yeah, and, and watching Minor is kind of jarring. There, there's a, 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 a Doctor Who trope that I like. That I put this in that category, like Paradise Tower, Paradise Towers, or Happiness Patrol, where the world is very cartoony in a way, and very mm. like it would never happen. You know what I mean? It's like when you compare. Um, my best comparison is like American comic books and then 2000 AD where there are no rules, sure. you know, you know, where we, sure. you know, it's, sure. um, and what I like about British science fiction sometimes is you don't need to know what it's like. Ours is Star Trek techno babble. They're rules. Yes. It's rigid. Where it's yours is fuck it. You landed up playing it of cartoon yeah. characters with Ray guns and whatever. Yeah. I kind of give it a pass on that. I like the, I'm, I'm such a fan of Holmes. I like the script so much because I can imagine this thing. I understand what you're saying. Cause it, it, we're getting to a point to where the sets are getting worse and worse and worse. Yeah. And you're seeing it in this season decline. Yeah. 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 Sharply all the way to the yeah. last one. There are huge, like, what are we doing? How could we have pour the fang rock? Yeah, an image of Fendal. Yeah, with great the fact, and they, the fact that they made the Fendal was made at another studio facility, you know, a couple of hundred miles away. You know, they didn't even make it at the the normal BBC, you know, set set of studio. But it looks professional. Yeah, they made it at, at Pebble Mill, and it looks a hundred times better than anything else in the series. Well, because I and I think what that what I get what you're saying about it. It, it doesn't look as it's the BBC. Even in this country, we go. The BBC makes some of the best television. Yeah, you know, well, you're, you yeah. know, because of the production values. And this yes. is sometimes Doctor Who. You're forgiving of it, and I think this is an era where you're seeing you're having to be more forgiving of it. Yeah, you have but to I, be. Yeah. I hold this one in high esteem, but it's all based on Roger Holmes' script. Right. Yeah, I could watch yeah. actors do that <laughs> on stage, and I'd be happy because there's the some funny um, shit in it. I think that's why my opinion of it has changed each time I've watched it in whatever context I'm watching it because, you know, you go from Image of the Fendal, which is really quite dark and quite atmospheric and full proper Haber horror, to this one, which is, if you're in the right mood, it is funny. Mm. It is very funny, but I think you have to be in the right mood for it. That's the trouble. Yeah, that's true. I can I can see that. I, I tend to always like it, but sometimes I also have these on. It's like... You know, having the radio on is having a doctor in the background, and I'm taking sure. it more in with the ears and the eyes. So yeah. let's move to uh, the next story. Yeah, uh, <laughs> Underworld. Um, yeah. 
we have a new script editor, Anthony Reed. Um, yes. But this is another Bob Baker, Dave Martin, directed what by Norman they? Stewart. Um, and this is the CSO nightmare, is the way I, I call this. The, Anthony Reed's one of the greatest people to work on Doctor Who. He's a legend. I wish he'd stayed longer. I, what, I don't. I'm not that familiar with what he did because he only. Well, wait a minute. Oh. Well, I've seen I've seen some of the other a lot of other stuff that he worked on, and he's, oh, okay. he's got a really good reputation sort of edit through his career. You know, for the sort of stuff that he'd done. Um, this is another one that I remember really clearly from from when it went out, and I remember soaking it up like a sponge. I think it's one of the best first episodes in the entire series because they're all in, it's all on a spaceship set, and which is really, a nice, a pretty good set. I think it's yeah, a better, it's, it's pretty good set. The special effects work, you know, for the planet forming and all that is excellent. And this this is the episode one is the one which swung me, you know, to think to to my bold statement earlier on that I think Louise is the greatest actor to ever appear in Doctor Who because. And this, because of this story, she doesn't really get the credit for it. She is phenomenal. You've got the stuff with the learning to write and read. She's she's wearing the doctor's hat, which is really cute, really sexy. And then there's the stuff where she gets manipulated by the sort of device that they've got. Yeah. And the way she plays everything and all of that is so natural and believable and convincing. Um, you do not for a moment think that this is Louise Jameson. You think this is Leela and she is flawless. Um, the CSO stuff, it's one of the, it's one of these ones The the money was running out. They had to try and do something. Um, yes, I am actually defending it. Um, <laughs> there's a ton of people in it who were on British television at the time. So it's nice to, for me, it's some, some of me, it's nice to see them. Um, there's one guy in it who actually, I looked a little bit like before my hair fell out, <laughs> who's also in the <laughs> Also in a really he's a, early, he's, a, he's a really obnoxious crew member of the spaceship, isn't he? He's he's in a really early episode of Blake Seven as well. Um, it's the boy with the big nose that helps them out that does all the floating. Oh, with oh them. okay, okay, that one. He looks an awful lot like I did when I was younger. I like him. I used to see him on telly when I was all the time when I was younger. Um, he looks like me, circa nineteen ninety five. So we we give him we we let him off for that. It's a weird one. I know this one. This is the one that always ends up in the bottom five of um any Doctor Who magazine poll or whatever. No no one has a good word to say about it. And I think that's a shame because Louise is doing something very special. It's there's some good jokes about eating rock, um, you know, being in references to Aberdeen, which is nice. Mm -hmm. Um and it's you know it's probably the definition of the the um the ambition not being able to, you know, but the resources not being able to live up to the ambition. I the the Jason the the um Jason and the Golden Fleece thing is quite an obvious thing for for Bob and Dave to do, but you know why not? It's a fun thing to do. It's the sort of thing that Doctor Who should do, I think. Yeah. Um, no, no, that I don't mind, so, and I I like some of the design. I like the costumes of the rope people with the masks that were kind yeah. of like, yeah. I think some of the aesthetics good. I find that just the CTCSO is just uh you're I'm just um it really takes me out of it. Sure. And I but That's and good. I don't think Tom's very good in it. Um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting one. I'd love to see the, I mean, there's, there is behind the scenes stuff on this one when you see sort of Tom sort of chatting away with Louise and the other folk while they're what, in the pause from the recording. And I think, I think, um, I think sometimes Tom, if he's, if he's not inspired by it or doesn't feel that it's worth his time, he's not going to make much more of an effort. And I'm guessing he maybe thought this might have been derivative. Yeah, I know. I know exactly what footage is being pretty shitty and probably no, just frustrated. But, Again, this is because this is one that I remember well from, or not well, but I remember clearly from when it went out. I was used to seeing bad CSO on television quite regularly. Oh yeah, so, yeah, 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 yeah. See, it's not know, something for us in America. We didn't really have it. We didn't really use yeah, it. Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't really take me out of it to the to the extent that maybe it does with some people. I mean, it's not my least favorite story of the series by any stretch. No, I I, would... I just looked at the last time I randomized it. It was last. <laughs> it was number three hundred and ten. <laughs> uh, it was yeah, I think Twin no, Dilemma are, was like three higher. There are plenty, plenty of stories I would rate this above. That I would I would watch this over anything in the first two Capaldi series. Definitely. Wow. 
I'm not yeah. a big the, the first Capaldi series is my least favorite series of I would of watch it era. over I would watch over it most of Jodie's I would watch it over some of the 80s stuff I would watch it over season 5 I would watch it over um season yeah, 5 of the original or season yeah, 5 season 5 Season five of the original, yeah. I um I get I get a lot from with me with me with Underworld, it's partly nostalgia, but Louise is just so good and you know this for all the, the poor special effects work, this is the first time they're trying to do kind of laser beams. They're trying they're trying to do Star Wars. Yeah, 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 yeah. They're nowhere near it. Yeah. But they're trying it. It's Doctor Who steering its way. Star Wars is starting to have the influence, and this is Doctor Who steering its way away from being what it's always been and trying to adjust to what people expect TV science fiction to be like now. You know, yeah. in the wake, in the wake of Star Wars. Yeah, um, and, and they just, you know, I I always applaud them for trying, and that's one thing, a reason I think I love Doctor Who is because it's a little engine that tries from time to time. One of yeah. my favorite, one of my favorite Doctor Who's uh, purely on try is I love the Web Planet. Right. Oh because yeah. I, you know, know what? what? It's like the paracut. That's giant. That is just such bravery to just to absolutely. lean into it. So, yeah, all right, we're up to the <laughs> final story of the season. It's a uh, inv mm -hmm. the invasion of time, which aired, uh, written by David Agnew, which means Anthony Reed and Graham Williams. Yeah. Um, directed Gerald Blake appear aired from February fourth, nineteen seventy eight, to March eleventh, nineteen seventy eight. I turned five during this story. Five. Then I yeah. would have wanted because I'm going to took this. I was in my 20s probably when I saw it. Right. I like these Gallifrey stories that Tom's in. I like Barusa. I wish we had, had more than I like this Barusa a great deal. I think this yes. is my favorite Barusa. Period. I I agree completely. I These think there are, are diminishing crazy. returns on Barusas. The first two are stellar. The next two are not so good. Yeah. Um. I think that. This is much better than the guy in Deadly Assassin. The guy in Deadly Assassin isn't in it as much. And one really obviously thing, the good thing about this is it's a sequel to the Deadly Assassin in a lot of ways. And it kind of um it uses all the imagery and the sets and set designs and stuff again from Deadly Assassin, which is a, which Doctor Who didn't really do much in those days. It didn't really no, do they a lot did. of no. they didn't really do continuity, you know, here's one that follows on from one from you know, it was very rare that you know, Ark in Space and Revenge of the Cybermen is probably the, the last time they did something even remotely similar. Yeah, uh, no, yeah, I, I, I get you. And I, that's the aspect of this story, that there's parts of this story that I really, really like, and then there are parts yeah. that really tweak me. Yeah. Um, I love the Gallifrey stuff. I like the... Uh, the Satarans aren't as good as they are. I think the Satarans in Old Who are all over the place. Yes. You know, and I really don't like the two doctor ones the tall ones yeah, um, they're yeah. yeah they're really kind of weird but these guys are okay i like it i like barusa i like all the tr i like all the trickery the doctor the, the this and i think tom's a little reined in in the in this one a bit oh really at okay. times i'm i think at least in the beginning uh, they lose me about halfway through yeah i think I, about yeah. when the vardens show up and they're running through that old hospital yeah, it's padded. It's a, I'm not a fan of six parters. I don't think yeah. I think most six parters are two episodes, two and a half episodes too long. Yeah, I mean, this is obviously another one that was sort of done in the emergency because another story fell through and they're probably, you know, they lost studio time. So they had to, you know, film so much of it in location. I mean, every, everyone knows that. Um, I agree with you. I think Tom is tremendous at the beginning, like the the bit where um, he tells Leela to tell K9 to tell her to shut up is astonishing. Yeah. See, they're so, good, so good at the beginning when he's being the, secretive. I don't think the relationship between the Doctor and the Companion had ever been treated in such an adult fashion before that. It's it's fascinating to watch. They, they do it so well. Leela being expelled from the Capitol and all that is really, really good. Um, I like the Sheboygan stuff. I like I like yeah. that we get a little more outside. Yeah, it fills it fills stuff in, and it's it, you know, and it obviously it builds on the deadly assassin really well for all that. And um, you know, as far as some Tarans, I I I had another, you know, behind the couch moment when when thingy takes his his helmet off, you know, and I remember that one really clearly. And I remember the the reason this the reason I remember this story really well is that the guy who plays Andred, um, Christopher Tranchel, I think his name is, he was also 
there was a there's a kids TV program like for preschoolers over here called Place called Play School. I've heard of it. Yeah, I don't think I've seen it. And Christopher was one of the presenters on that. So I I were watching Doctor Who and there's Christopher from Play School. Because I remember mm -hmm. watching Play School while this was on and being like, hey, okay, it's so Andred. Like Fantastic. But that's that's the reason I've, I've been able to remember this one so clearly was because he was in it. Um, but I agree with you. Some of the some of the stuff towards the end is just weeks of desperation when they're running through brick corridors and all that. And there's the bit when um even the sonic screwdriver will get me out of this one, which oh, is another God. Tom starting to rip the piss. And you can tell he's enjoying himself in the location filming. Um yeah, yeah. You know, with it. And you know, it's I think it's a, as far as it's one of these ones that just about holds together. It's a great example of what you said earlier on about having just having it on in the background because I I stuck this on actually very recently. Um when I was I was spending some time filing some comics and I just let this play through in the background. Because you you don't have to watch it, you can follow it perfectly. It's it's um it's one of these ones. If they'd had a little bit more money, if they hadn't had to film in a hospital, you know, a little bit more time, if they hadn't lost the studio yeah, time, it probably would be regarded. I think I it's more than some of the other ones in the season. I have a uh, there's a bit of Doctor Who that I've always been one hundred percent uns unsatisfied about is whenever we go into the bowels of the TARDIS, the sets suck. Yeah, it's. Do you remember that, there was there was an eleventh Doctor story? What was it called? Journey uh, to the Center of the Tardis. No, it was one that no the doc the Doctor's wife. Yeah, it was a doc, and the corridors looked terrible. I remember being really excited and thinking, yes, for the first time in the new series, we're going to see inside the ship. They, and and looked, they were I, shit. They were. I know exactly. The they were terrible. It looked the Enterprise, or what was the submarine and voice at the bottom of the sea? It looked like that. Oh, it was. It, it reeked you know, of stink. Um, yeah, I did. Uh, it, it, I think that, they were a bit better in Journey to the Center of the Tardis, yeah. not much. Yeah, they never yeah. get it right, apart from yeah. the, the Davidson stories. Yeah, the Davidson story is the only time, really. Um, I want to say this, and because this is, I think, and I think most, there are very few good companion yeah. exits, and Leela's is one of the worst because she deserves yeah. so much better. Yeah, she and really I, does. And I yeah. think Big Finish give us that by having her live on. I like the Gallifrey stuff she's in. It's a you know some of it's rough, but yeah. I like I like what we've gotten from it. But it's I really just think it just it's, it's what the hell. I mean, uh, again, it's rushed. They thought they were going to keep her, or or uh, yeah, I think it's I think the same happened. I think basically the same thing happened with Mary the following year, which is why they had to get Lila to regenerate a few times at the start of Destiny of the Daleks because yeah. yeah. Back. Cause, cause um, it's it's an interesting thing. Um, it just about works. I think the way the three the way the three of them play it, um, it just about works. You know when Tom said, you know when Andred says, "Doctor, I hope," and and the doctor says, "Yes, I'm sure you do." <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, and you can tell he's going to miss her because they've never got on too well. Um, you know, but you know, when he closes the doors of the ship and inside and he looks quite sad, you know. And I do like that the, line. The dog stays behind as well, which is quite a big deal. Um But it's yeah, I agree with you. I think it's it probably is it's I mean it's it's slightly better than Dodo's in that um at least that happens on screen, you know, the departure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Well, it's time to rank them, and I'll yep. go first with number my number six which is underworld i ranked it 310 i have to rank it at least six in this one it didn't okay. it didn't it didn't move up right so what's your least favorite my number six is is the sun makers wow okay okay um we'll do my number five my number five is the invisible enemy my number five is also the invisible enemy yeah it's just oh it's just a mess all right, so my number. <laughs> Wait a minute. Okay, so my number five would be not number five. My number four would be the Sunmakers. Okay, my mine is Underworld because Louise is just so good in it that she she boosts it above the others. She okay. she's so good in it. All right, I'm gonna move to my three. I'm gonna make Invasion a time because I do like the first half so much. Yeah, if if that if they just stayed in the capital, mm. you know, mm. Mm. yeah, invasion of time is also my number three. This is interesting. They're not okay. they're far apart. 
We do All usually right. pretty well. This is good. All right. Number my number two is Image of Fendal. Same. Yep. Image of Fendal. Yeah. Yep. And then it's got to be hor- horrifying. Like it's a near perfect story. It is just yeah. mwah. There's the nothing. Only thing, I, the only thing that I think would have improved it would have been one scene of them inside the TARDIS at the start. Yeah, um, the, yeah. Uh, something yeah. I didn't it's mention totally we were talking about is even with the original special effects, Tom talking to the Rootin is believable and the Rootin is a real character. Yes. So, yeah. All was, right. It, yeah. The well, that was a blast. Fried egg. Yeah. It was a blast. I, it was a good, you know, I like, I do like that season. I do like Tom's era, but yeah. sometimes, you know. It's kind of, I think it's kind of, for me in, in, in the whole Tom Pantheon, it's kind of middling. Yeah, um, I mean, there's a lot of good Tom, though. I mean, his first three seasons are just, yeah, you know, yeah. Just, I mean, I think the, the show was its best during Hinchcliffe Holmes. I think, yeah, I I think that's great. where they really artistically yeah. and production wise and and producing. I think, I think Hinchcliffe, there's some great producers of Original Who, Let's yeah. Hinchcliffe and Lambert. Yes. Are the master tele- makers of television. I would agree with you. I think you know, I think the season suffers in a way because obviously there have been a lot of complaints about the level of violence in the Tom Baker story. So that they were, you know, yeah, so they, much yeah they were making some course corrections in the previous series. So this is when they really started to kind of dial it back. And that's why Horror Fang Rock feels like a bit of a holdover from what was getting done before. And even um, in, Imogen Fendal is. Yeah, There's, we don't Start see anything that, like that. They don't even right. attempt to do horror again. For yeah. I don't think they do it until they do to the modern show. I, I mean, there's some elements in Sylvester's last series, I think. But you're, you know, Fenric and Ghostlight. But you know, yeah, and I, I, I don't know where you stand on the Ghostlight scale. I put Ghostlight very high. I'm a couple of moments in Caves of Androzani and a couple of bits in towards the end of Trial of a Time Lord when they're vaguely, I mean, that you know, they're vaguely trying because Robert Holmes is involved and they're trying to. He knows what you know. They've lost sight of that scare, putting the kids behind the couch. Yeah, it's sort of part of it's, it's it's something that as I'm I'm a Moffat fan, and I think Moffat said his best when he's scaring the the hell out of a kid. Yeah, and I think yeah. he understands yeah. it, and I think he could the the original Blink. I think the Weeping Angels yeah. don't always work because they work best when you don't know what the hell's going on. Yeah, you know. Blink's- I think it's a classic. That's what I'm just and, and I'm a big fan of Silence in the Library, the skeletons in the spacesuit. That's and the um that's that's probably my that's in my that'd be in my bottom ten. Really? Yeah. That I, one and a couple from Matt's last series. I, 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 I'm, I'm see I'm I'm not a Moffat fan, as we know, as I as I've said many times. Yeah. Uh, and I've, I've probably I've probably said the same thing a hundred times on on Power of Three, but it's for me he's just he's very self derivative, very repetitive. Um, you know, it's I remember my sister made a joke about um, what a potential Doctor Who monster could be, and then he basically did it <laughs> oh in God. one of the Capaldi ones, and Alison was just like, you know what. No, I'm I'm not a Moffat fan, but I, I can see when he does it well and Blink is a masterpiece. For me, Silence in the Library, Forest of the Dead was just a complete rehash of everything that he'd done already. It was overly complicated for its own, too overly complicated for its own good and just wasn't entertaining. So yeah. I I like him because no. of the reason I like certain certain writers because he writes for his actors. He's not writing and that and sometimes it doesn't hit for the audience. He's giving the actors something to do. And that's probably fair yeah you know think, it's because but, it's i'm giving this i'm giving them words to say it's like when you watch it i mean he's not tarantino but like tarantino writes for the actors yeah even though I, um, they say that he doesn't it's like yeah he does he's giving you mammoth who i think david mammoth's a prick and his stuff is disgusting but as a, someone who wanted to be an actor i would love to play yeah. a mammoth character because the words are sure. magic yeah no i um I'm quite, I'm always quite I was <laughs> I'm always quite vocal. And it's weird because um Tom who who used to be on Power Three quite early, he's he's good friends with Stephen Moffat. So <laughs> I always have to be I always feel I have to read in what I say. I'm I'm not a fan of the Moffat method at all, really. Um it's one it's one of these things once I kind of work or twigged how he was the way he did it, I just couldn't get past it, you know. There's there's other stuff like I don't like the I suppose you should probably save this for another time, to be honest. I'm not a fan of the 
he sexualized the doctor and the companion relationship. And I didn't think that was ever appropriate or or funny or what Doctor Who should be about. And um it always made me quite uncomfortable and and well, see, shape, I see that like, with I see liked, that with Davies. I don't like the using. I, well, see, I think with Russell, it was it was more romantic with a capital R, especially you know stuff with Rose and Mark. It was kind of soap opera stuff. But the thing I'll say about Moffat, by the time he got to um, Capaldi, it was like watching a an, an IT what, what would you know our third channel over here. Like, it was like watching a nine pm adult drama about a, a middle aged businessman trying to cock block his secretary's boyfriend. That's how I was getting mm. Capaldi's first series. I hated it. I and really don't like his first season uses, at all. Cause it's he uses um the same broken machine motif again and again and again. And, oh, you know, I, just, that's a, and as much just, as I'm a fan of his, his that is my least favorite in modern Who season. Cause I think there's only like maybe one good episode. Yeah. If, I, if you add I, in all the best parts from it and kill the moon it broke me. My brother was like, right. I hate it. The moon's not an egg. Yeah. And he's like, it's yeah. Doctor Who. All the years of watching cheap Doctor Who and that broke your, your applause, yeah. your, your, uh, uh, what is it when you have to accept a story, you know? Yeah. yeah. It just it killed me. All yeah. right. Well, I'll probably cut all that out because I'll probably have you come on and do a mop at one just to let you freely bash. Yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> that'd be um, a lot Maybe we could do the first Capaldi series. That'd be fucking oh, hilarious. Oh, my fucking horrible, man. It it's fucking big, so imagine. fucking... And I love Capaldi's Doctor. That's the sad part. <laughs> All right, uh, David, thanks for having us on. Hey, plug your stuff to, for folks. Thank you for having me. Following in such esteemed footsteps, people like um, Melvin and Jeff, it's a pleasure to be here. Mm -hmm. Um, Yes, I'm the regular co-host on the Earth 2 podcast, which is a DC Comics podcast, which charts the, the, the DC multiverse really between 1961 and 1986. Um, we focus on the, the Golden Age superheroes and the stories that told of them in the, what was then the modern era. I'm also a regular contributor to a Doctor Who podcast called The Power of Three. Um, my friend Kenny Smith is the main curator of that one, and he's his infinite address book and his endless list of contacts means that we can get some really good interview guests um, on. We've just had... Um, Jason Quinn, the new editor of Doctor Who magazine, come on. We've got Dominic Glynn coming up very soon. Oh, very um, cool. We started kind of working towards, you know, now that Big Finish have announced an adaptation of Goth Opera, we're going to try and get some people involved in that one quite soon. Kenny does all oh, this. Oh, they're, just... doing they're doing Goth Opera? Yeah, they're doing Goth Opera. Um, and occasionally, mm. even more occasionally, I contribute to Kenny's other Doctor Who podcast, Pieces of Eight, which is all eight Doctor focused. And sometimes um, I guest on uh, an excellent Starman dedicated podcast <laughs> called Opal City Confidential. Yes. I get to talk to my pal Ross all about Starman and he gets me on for certain episodes of that and I love doing it and we're going to do it again soon, I hope. So that's... Yes, so that's we need to. I think we also need to find a story that we could weave in some Golden Age Hour Man stories like I did the Sandman ones. Ooh. <laughs> yeah. I've been thinking about that. Everybody's favorite uh, Golden Age hero because we all picked one. You know, we all yeah. have one, you know? Yeah, I would have lots to say about Rex. I love him. He's my man. Well, all right, folks. Well, that's it. And um, please check out um, regular duck. This I'm jumping in and out. Uh, this I don't know when this is going to drop. It's going to drop between our normal the normal story stuff, either probably between Blood Tide uh, and uh, I'm going to be covering the first new adventure novel that took me 35, 30 years to read, and I still hate it. <laughs> and J Jason Miller from Doctor Who Literature is going to come on and try to convince me it's not as bad as I think it is <laughs> um, but luck. until then folks hey we look forward to seeing you somewhere